Hello, everybody. This is Ken Brown with Transportation Energy Partners. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar. Um, today, we're going to focus on what the 20, 2018 elections mean for the future of clean transportation policy and what the outlook is for the, the new Congress. I believe it's the 116th Congress, um, both in this year and the next year. Um, we have, uh, before we get started, I just want to thank our sponsors. Um, uh, without them, uh, our work could not be possible and, uh, and today's webinar could not be possible. So thanks again to, uh, our, our sponsors and partners who, uh, are supporting our work. Um, and I'd like to introduce you to our distinguished group of panelists who have, who we have with us today. Um, we have a good, a great group of experts who are in Washington, D.C., uh, tracking federal policies, working with the Congress and uh, our federal agencies on a, on a daily basis. Um, so you're hearing, you will be hearing from, from all of the insiders today on uh, what is and isn't happening at Washington in, in, during the uh, current time. Um, you're going to hear from Allison Cunningham from NGV America, uh, Joshua Goldman with the Union of Concerned Scientists, and Paul Winters with the National Biodiesel Board. So thanks to all of our panelists for uh, joining us today. Um, <clears throat> before we jump into the details, a quick reminder for those of you who don't know Transportation Energy Partners, uh, we provide policy support to the nation's clean cities coalitions and our 15,000 stakeholders across the country. Uh, we keep coalitions and stakeholders informed of key policies, programs, and funding opportunities, and we work to educate decision makers about the importance of advancing markets for cleaner fuels and, and vehicles. Um, and uh, we thank all of the Clean Cities Coalition leaders and industry partners who are with us today on today's webinar. Um, I think most of you know that on February 11th to 13th, we will be having uh, our annual Energy Independence Summit here in Washington, D.C. Um, <clears throat> this is a a great annual event. Um, we will be interacting with uh, administration and congressional leaders. We'll have presentations on a wide variety of uh, um, important industry trends, topics, funding sources. Um, uh, there will be industry leaders there from uh, Cummins, Westport, Nissan, Volkswagen, UPS, uh, natural gas leaders, propane leaders, uh, biofuels leaders, electric vehicle leaders, they'll all be uh, with us in Washington, D.C. So if you haven't registered yet for the summit, please do so. Um, we'll be having roundtables with uh, at least for sure the Department of Energy, and hopefully the government will be open soon and uh, other agencies that are not currently open for business will be uh, participating as well. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is the 25th anniversary uh, of the DOE Clean Cities program, so we're going to have a reception honoring uh, leaders of the, of the Clean Cities program, um, which you're not going to want to miss. Um, on Tuesday, February 11th, we'll be on Capitol Hill. Um, uh, we're organizing over 250 meetings with congressional offices. Uh, so it's an opportunity for you all uh, to share what's going on in your communities, the great work that you're doing, the great progress you're making, and how important it is to have federal support uh, for your projects. Um, and then also on Tuesday evening, we'll uh, be, uh, UPS will be hosting uh, the annual reception for all of us at their uh, townhouse on Capitol Hill, and that's a, a great event that you're not going to want to miss. So um, go to our website, transportationenergypartners.org, to register for the upcoming summit. Uh, and I just want to stress how important it is that we have a good showing of, 
uh, folks from Queen Cities Coalitions and our industry partners. Uh, we've been successful over the last several years in increasing funding uh, for uh, the Queen Cities program and the EPA diesel emission reduction grants. And that's in the face of efforts from the current administration to eliminate those programs. We were able to save, not only save the programs, but increase funding. Um, in addition, um, working uh, with the help and leadership of our industry partners, uh, we were able to extend the tax in incentives at least through 2017. Um, and we've been supportive of the uh, biofuels industries in um, uh, enhancing and increasing volumes under the renewable fuel standard. But none of that is possible without without the efforts of folks across the country and coming to Washington makes a big difference. So um, we hope you will join us again this year. Um, so what's going on in the political world and the world of Washington, D.C.? Um, uh, two major things currently. Um, one, we had a big election in 2018, which has um, changed the landscape significantly. Uh, the Democrats uh, are now in the majority of the House. They gained 40 seats. Um, and what that means is that they will um, set the agenda in the House, number one, and number two, um, have a much more significant role in terms of negotiating uh, major issues with uh, the Republicans who are leading the Senate and, uh, um, and the White House. Um, <clears throat> and obviously, in addition to um, now having the Speaker of the House and the majority leader, uh, Democrats will now chair all of the committees that we work with, including the Energy Committee, the Appropriations Committees, and the, and the Tax Committee. Um, the House uh, has decided to bring back the Select Committee on Climate Change, and so issues like climate change will receive more attention and visibility in the House. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, bipartisan support for our work and clean transportation policies and funding um, remains strong. Um, the other big piece of news, which would be hard to miss, is that uh, um, the government and policymakers are consumed and paralyzed by the current partial shutdown. Um, I think it's likely that the administration will continue to propose cuts in clean energy programs. Uh, another thing that's going to be different this year compared to the past two years in terms of federal funding is um, two years ago, uh, the House, Senate, uh, and, and administration and both parties came together to agree um, on overall top line budget numbers for two years, which made it a lot easier to negotiate the appropriations bills and pass them during the past two years. There is no agreement on what the numbers are for the next fiscal year, which is fiscal year 2020. And so that's gonna make, um, that could delay the process number one, and it could also make it much more contentious this year. Um, and finally, you're going to hear a little bit more about this, but there uh, has been a lot of discussion, at least, about infrastructure legislation, and both the administration and um, leaders in Congress have indicated interest in that, and so we could see some action there. Um, in terms of our transport, our clean transportation priorities, um, <coughs> which we're going to get into in detail, one is to extend the tax incentives, which are expired. Um, second is to um, preserve and strengthen the renewable fuel standard. Third is to increase federal funding for key alternative fuels programs like the Clean Cities Program and the EPA uh, Clean Diesel Grants um, to uh, break the log jam at the Federal Highway Administration, which has stalled uh, funding for um, hundreds of clean vehicle projects and to 
picture. Now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Allison Cunningham with NGV America, who's going to talk about um, the federal tax incentives. Uh, Allison, take it away. All right, Ken. Thanks so much for having me on your webinar today. I'm glad to come and let you know what us and others have been doing in terms of tax extenders. Um, for those of you who are not aware, tax extenders are the set of 30 or so tax credits that are often extended on a short-term basis. So a lot in the past we've seen them one year back and one year forward or one year retroactively. So these 30 or so expired at the end of 2017. And actually the retroactive extension for 2017 was put into law during FY 2018 omnibus spending bill that was passed in March of 2018. Uh, this is important because it sets a precedent for retroactively extending these credits for the previous year. So currently all of these credits are, are lapsed and they include the alternative fuels tax credit, alternative fuel vehicle refueling property credit, biodiesel and renewable diesel credits, and certain biofuel producer credits. Of note, the electric vehicle credit is not a part of these extenders, so that's important to bear in mind that that's elsewhere within the tax code. So currently these are expired, and we are hoping to get them reinstated. Uh, so if you'll go to the next slide, Ken. Just to give a recap of comprehensive tax reform to kind of set the stage for where things were, where things are, and where they're headed. Uh, comprehensive tax reform was completed in December of 2017. The bill was passed by a mechanism called reconciliation. So something called the Bird Rule kicked in, and this essentially limited the amount of deficit impact the bill was allowed to have. Unfortunately for us and for our industries, um, the energy credits were not considered due to their relatively high cost, due to them being a, an item they could easily just kind of defer and deal with later so that it didn't impact kind of their overall numbers to keep within the bird rule so they were not dealt with uh, also worth noting an initial house version of tax reform repealed the electric vehicle credit but that was not signed into law it ended up maintaining that vehicle credit at least for now you've probably seen a lot of headlines about that in the past several months uh, additionally alt fuels tax credit and other related extenders were not included in comprehensive reform but they were introduced later in a hatch bill, which basically had a one year forward, one year retroactive extension of um, energy extenders or that kind of expired extenders. So with a new Congress, uh, Chairman Hatch is gone and a new extender bill would need to be introduced for consideration. But speaking of a new Congress, let's take a look at the tax policy landscape there. Uh, as Ken kind of mentioned, we've entered the 116th Congress with Republicans maintaining control of the Senate and Democrats taking control of the House. With retirements and changes of power, we have new leadership in Senate Finance and House Ways and Means. Chuck Grassley of Iowa takes over as Chairman of Senate Finance. He replaces the now retired Orrin Hatch, who had been a champion for the all fields tax credit. Uh, Ron Wyden remains the ranking member. Notably, and I'm sure others will speak to this later on, uh, Chairman Grassley is a strong supporter of biodiesel. In fact, he came out in the press yesterday and stated that he has a desire to support tax incentives for renewable and alternative energy sources and in providing long-term certainty for renewable incentives and alternative fuel credits. So that's very helpful. Over on the House side, Richard Neal of Massachusetts, of Massachusetts has assumed the chairmanship of House Ways and Means. Former, Kevin, former Chairman Kevin Brady is now the ranking member. Uh, Richard Neal has in the past been a supporter of alt-fuels tax credits, so we're hopeful that will continue. Uh, Ranking member Brady, as you are likely aware, is not a fan of extenders and attempted to get rid of some of them in his last-ditch tax bills right before the holiday break. So what is the outlook for extenders this year? As Ken mentioned, the shutdown is really consuming Washington. There's not a lot that can go on, and we certainly can't attach anything like extenders to a spending agreement in the current landscape. We also can't really pivot to tax related measures until the government's open. Even then, there's a possibility that bad blood between the parties may linger for a while. So both parties in the Senate and the House Democrats are interested in extenders. So that is good news. However, it's worth noting that I hear Democrats are interested in expanding the universe of extenders and including more of their priorities. So this could drive the cost of the total extender package up and may cause more political challenges for the whole package later on. 
a long-term fix for extenders would be preferable and may help avoid some of these political pitfalls. So that's another reason why Grassley's mention of a long-term fix is such good news. IRS filing deadlines are driving timelines for extenders. Generally, I think they'd like to get them done prior to March or end of Q1 so that when folks begin to file their taxes, which I believe they start doing in something like 18 days, they'll be able to take advantage of retroactive credits. So we're hopeful to have a tax bill in Q1 that we can attach extenders to. So next steps for that. Uh, on behalf of NGV America, I lead a working group slash coalition that is focused on the all fuels tax credit specifically. All fuel types are welcome to join. We currently have participation from natural gas, propane, hydrogen, and others. And we are actively planning a strategy for this Congress. Primarily right now, we are educating staff on a scoring issue related to the alt fuels tax credit and alt fuels mixture credit. Uh, this is a very wonky kind of issue that we are, are dealing with. So uh, if anybody has any follow-up questions, I'm glad to discuss offline. But essentially the alt fuels tax credit and alt fuels mixture credit have been scored or given a cost estimate together in the past. And there has never been an issue associated, or there's never been a cost associated with the alt fuels mixture credit until the Brady bill was scored in December. So essentially it left lawmakers looking as if the alt fuels tax credit had a much higher cost than it really has. So we're working to educate staff on the reason for the score increase and related strategy and the possibility of separating the fuels tax credit and the mixture credit. So if anybody is interested in assisting with alt fuels tax credit extension efforts or wants any more issues on information on the score issue, uh, my email address is there, a Cunningham at ngvamerica.org. We'd be glad to have you join our efforts or answer any questions. Great, thanks, Allison. Um, and I want to encourage everybody, um, anybody who's got questions, to type them in your question box, and we'll uh, we'll try and get to as many questions as we can. Um, with that, I'm now going to turn it over to. Uh, Joshua Goldman, who's with the Union of Concerned Scientists, and um, he's going to give an update on where we are with the EV electric vehicle tax credit, um, uh, where we've seen efforts to both eliminate it or weaken it and also efforts to strengthen and expand it. So, uh, Josh, thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Ken, and good afternoon, everybody, from the eye of the shutdown. So like Ken said, I'm going to take a couple minutes to walk you through what's happening with the current tax credit on Capitol Hill. And right now, the existing tax credit is up to 7500 bucks for a qualifying EV until a manufacturer sells 200,000 EVs. Note that this is tied to electric vehicle sales, not actual um, applications for the, for the tax credit. Um, so once a manufacturer hits that 200,000 threshold, they have two quarters to continue to sell EVs for the full credit. Then the credit is cut in half for two quarters and then half again for the next two quarters and then ultimately eliminated. So uh, Tesla hit the cap at the very end of Q2 2018 um, and they did so deliberately so that they could have Q3 and Q4 of 2018 to deliver as many vehicles as possible so that those people could take advantage of the full tax credit before it was cut in half, which just started a couple days ago as we clicked over to 2019. GM also hit the cap in Q4 2018. So if you are interested in a GM electric vehicle like the, like the Bolt or the Volt, if you can still find one, uh, then probably now is the time to get it before the credit is uh, cut in half beginning in Q3 2019. Uh, Nissan is forecast to hit the 200,000 vehicle cap in 2020, maybe sooner, it's hard to say, um, and other automakers are not that far behind, most notably BMW. Uh, next slide, please. So in the last Congress, we had a couple bills that would have uh, modified the EV tax credit. Uh, from uh, the Republican side of the aisle, we have the Fairness for Every Driver Act. This was introduced last October by Senator Barrasso from Wyoming, and it would have simply terminated the vehicle, the electric vehicle tax credit, and place a user fee on EV drivers. 
It only garnered two co-sponsors, which is not uh, too encouraging, um, nor was it taken up by the Senate Finance Committee. Um, it also had a House companion bill, which, would, which was sponsored by Representative Smith from Missouri. Um, and neither got a lot of traction. legislation that was more of a must-pass measure. So although it, it didn't get any hearings in, in committee, there certainly was the potential for this, this to, to pass and become law. Next slide, please. And on the other side of the aisle, uh, the Democrats introduced what's called the Electric Cars Act. This was from Senators Merkley from Oregon, Heinrich of New Mexico, and Cortez Masto of Nevada. This would have extended both the vehicle tax credit, which is Section 30B, and the vehicle infrastructure tax credit, which is Section 30C, for 10 years. And it would have eliminated the manufacturer cap. So this would be unlimited tax credits for any manufacturer um, and then phasing out ultimately in 2028. This also had a House companion bill introduced by a couple of representatives. And um, like the Fairness for Driver Act, uh, it didn't uh, gather a lot of attention in committee. There were no hearings. It didn't go through committee markup, but it also had the potential to pass or hitch a ride on a larger piece of legislation, although that didn't happen. And so the Electric Cars Act and the Fairness for Every Driver Act, um, you know, both were discarded at the end of the last Congress. And as we started this new Congress, they will have to be reintroduced um, if, if they're going to ultimately get passed. Next slide, please. So uh, for those of you who are planning on attending the Energy Summit in February um, and would like to talk to some senators or representatives about EVs, um, here's just a couple points on why EVs should, uh, should have federal support. You might know a lot of this already, but here are some of, of my favorites because there are pretty much unlimited reasons why EVs should be supported by both federal, state, and local governments. So the first reason, maybe the most compelling, is that EVs save drivers money, period. Uh, our analysis has found that EVs can save drivers up to 800 bucks a year just in fuel costs and thousands more on scheduled maintenance because EVs require less periodic maintenance like no oil changes, fewer brake, brake pad replacements, et cetera. And these benefits are especially important for rural drivers who can save up to $870 a year by choosing an electric vehicle because they, rural drivers tend to drive farther than more urban drivers. The second reason why EVs need federal support is that they reduce emissions. Um, the average EV sold in the US produces the emissions equivalent of a gas powered vehicle that gets 80 miles per gallon. That's better than any uh, like Toyota Prius or traditional hybrid on the road today. And that miles per gallon equivalent number is going to continue to improve as more renewables are incorporated into our national electricity grid um, and EVs can become uh, only cleaner, whereas gasoline vehicles will continue to get dirtier as the upstream emissions from oil production continue to get, uh, continues to get higher. Uh, and lastly, EVs can create domestic jobs. Um, Tesla certainly has been a job creator in California and in Nevada with their Gigafactory. Nissan makes the Nissan Leaf in Nevada and GM uh, makes the Bolt and Volt in Michigan. Um, and so continuing America's leadership in electric vehicle sales, incentives, and deployment um, will incentivize companies to continue building them here in the U.S. Next slide, please. Um, and, and lastly, and perhaps most nefariously, um, I think it's important to point out that the only opponent to extending the EV tax credit is the oil industry. And uh, I don't blame them. Uh, I would probably oppose it too if I worked for the oil industry. And that's because oil comprises 90% of all transportation fuel consumed in the United States. And they see electric vehicles as threatening this market share. Electric vehicles are becoming more popular. Uh, more models are becoming available across the United States. And there's a real public enthusiasm for switching from gas to electricity. Um, and so oil companies um, sort of undertook what's one of the worst kept secrets here in Washington, and that is that you know, they, they are advocating for the tax credit to be eliminated, but they're, they're advocating uh, through sort of front groups that they prop up with uh, funding through uh, NGOs, and they also uh, fund misleading science that uh, skews data to reach poor conclusions, and then their funded advocacy groups then take that analysis to the Hill. Uh, and then, of course, they also fund politicians, including Senator Barrasso, who introduced the Fairness for Every Driver Act, 
Um, and, and really what they're seeking to do is just keep the status quo. And um, I think moving forward in terms of how we fuel transportation and our transportation-based economy is a really important message that can resonate with both sides of the aisle. I mean, in favor of the EV tax credit, you not only have automakers and NGOs, but you also have consumer groups, um, the general public, and anyone concerned with, with clean air and clean transportation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and I'll end with a totally shameless plug, um, which is if you are looking for more data points on EVs or on fuel economy or clean transportation more broadly, I would certainly encourage you to check out our website, which is listed on this slide here. We have data points on nearly everything you can think of, including emissions, fuel savings, maintenance costs, battery price forecasts, model availability, charger location, infrastructure investments, you name it, we probably have it. If we don't have it, I'll find it for you. Feel free to just drop me a note at email or um, you can check out my, my blogs and, and find me through there, through um, just searching me on the internet. Or you can just go directly to the UCS uh, website. And uh, with that, I will turn it back to Ken. Great, thanks Josh, that was great. Um, I got one question for you before we move on, or at least one so far. One is, sure. uh, do you do you know if the Electric Cars Act includes uh, hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles? I imagine it does, but I can't say for certain. I'd have to pull up the bill text, which I don't have in front of me. But typically, alternative fuel tax credits cover hydrogen as well. That would be my guess as well, but I also don't know for sure. So we will... Um, between Josh and I, we will get the answer to that um, and make sure we send it out to everybody. Um, let's see. Let's see. Um, here's another, uh, maybe we'll get to this question a little later. Um, All right, with that, um, I'm now going to uh, introduce Paul Winters, who's with the uh, National Biodiesel Board. Um, and uh, Paul's going to give us an update on where we stand with the renewable fuel standard. Uh, well, thank Thanks, you, Paul. Ken. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate Transportation Energy Partners making the renewable fuel standard. A priority from our perspective, from the from NBB and the biodiesel industry's perspective, the program continues to be indispensable uh, for the for the future. And now that Andrew Wheeler has been nominated to the EPA administrator post, and it's going to have a confirmation hearing next week, uh, there's an opportunity for senators to ask him to commit to the program's success. And that's going to be important in 2019 as EPA initiates a reset of the remaining RFS volumes through 2022. So to, uh, to start off, the this year's rule, the recently finalized RFS volumes for 2019 provided a little bit of good news. The RFS statute, as it was originally written, called for a half billion gallon increase in the overall advanced biofuel category for 2019. And we know that EPA, when it first started developing the 2019 rule and consulting with USDA and the Department of Energy, wanted to hold the advanced and biomass-based diesel volumes at the same levels as 2017 and 2018. You can see in the table on the right that volumes have been held relatively flat for several years. But by the time the rule was proposed and made public, and then in the final rule that was issued at the end of November, EPA did provide the statutorily required increase. And that was good news for the biodiesel producers because uh, they fill about 90% of the advanced biofuel volumes each year. So it provided real growth for our industry. Now, 
EPA's methodology is still flawed. Uh, they are not providing room for all of the advanced biofuel that can be produced each year. And the final rule left several issues unresolved, chiefly uh, the issuing of small refinery exemptions. Uh, over the past year or year and a half, EPA retroactively exempted from the program uh, for the years 2016 and 2017, every small refiner that petitioned. And now the agency court cases uh, that are aiming to resolve it, uh, or it could be resolved through administrative action by EPA. Uh, for the biodiesel industry, the loss from those small refinery exemptions is roughly equivalent to the increase that was given in 2019. So to us, EPA is raising volumes with one hand and lowering them with the other. And we know that Congress is paying attention to this issue. EPA is also kind of dragging its feet on restoring 500 million gallons from 2016. Uh, for, to the RSS program. And this is where the U.S. Court of Appeals ruled against the agency's use of its general waiver authority. And the agency left decisions on E15 and RIN market reform to a separate rulemaking. And despite promises from uh, acting administrator Wheeler for increased transparency, the agency isn't really providing any new data or any information that wasn't already known. So we're looking for more uh, transparency in the future. Nonetheless, the, the increase in volumes for 2019 is a very positive step as EPA turns to the reset provision. So if we go to the next slide. the So the RFS rules say that if EPA waives statutory volumes by more than 50% or by 20% in two consecutive years, then it has to rewrite the schedule of volumes set by Congress through 2022. And with the 2019 rule, the overall volume was waived by more than 20% in two consecutive years. 2018 and 2019. So nonetheless, the, the impact of the reset is, is somewhat limited since EPA is only going to have, EPA would have had the same discretion and authority to set the volumes starting in 2023. So you see in the table on the right, the remaining volumes for 2020, 2021, and 2022 that EPA is going to rewrite. They're not going to be changing the 2020 biomass-based diesel volume, which was set in uh, the 2019 rule. And we expect that the reset rule is going to be released roughly in tandem with next year's RFS rule. So the same, uh, so it's unclear that EPA, it's unlikely that EPA is going to change its process much for the next year. The process for resetting and, and for setting uh, volumes past 2022 is laid out in the statute, very clearly defined. And in fact, EPA has used this process to set biomass-based diesel volumes since 2013. And that, uh, Congress originally set biomass-based diesel volumes only through the year 2020. 2012. So EPA already has well-established rules in place, and if the agency follows the process it has been using for biomass-based diesel, then there should be stability and predictability for everyone. Now, MBB and other stakeholders met with EPA last August to discuss this reset process. 
and we know that once the rule is out, there will be the opportunity for public comment on both the reset and, uh, and next year's rule. So it's going to be important to engage in that process and ensure that EPA maintains stability in the rulemaking process. It's a, a very important opportunity to weigh in on uh, how the, on the impl implementation of the program over past years. That's going to be a key issue uh, in analyzing the reset. So if we go to the next slide, please. Now, with EPA pursuing the reset, it's less likely that Congress is going to continue the RFS reform efforts of the past couple of years. Uh, the House is now led by Democrats, and RFS reform is not on their agenda, although uh, Chairman Frank Pallone has indicated that oversight of the program is, is a priority for him. So uh, there has been this process of, among the, uh, the Republicans over the past couple of years to uh, try to reform the program, particularly to try to negotiate changes between the biofuels industry and the oil industry. And in November, just before Thanksgiving, literally the day before Thanksgiving, uh, Rep Representative John Shimkus from Illinois finally unveiled the result of his years long effort to negotiate changes to the RFS program. And the main feature of his proposal was a sunset of the RFS. Now it was a, it was a discussion draft, it was not legislation, it was never introduced as legislation. So, um, you know, it still kind of lives on uh, as a potential piece of legislation for the future. Uh, but since the Republicans are not in charge of the House, it's less likely that it's uh, going to get any attention in the 116th Congress. On the Senate side, Senator Cornyn from Texas had been leading the RFS reform effort. <clears throat> he is now deferring to Senator uh, Barrasso, who will be chair of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. Uh, Senator Cornyn never released the draft that he had been working on for more than a year. Uh, Senator Barrasso and Senator Inhofe are our key chairmen on the EPW committee. They are they are the um, they have oversight of the EPA and the Renewable Fuel Standard. So there are several champions uh, and allies of the RFS program on that committee, and it's important for us to ensure that they are very well prepared to defend the program uh, against any plans of, of Senator Barrasso or uh, Senator Inhofe. And if you can go to the next slide, please. So our key messages in talking to our champions in both House and, House and Senate are uh, focusing on energy security, the economy, jobs, as well as the environmental benefits. Uh, there's something there that is going to appeal to various audiences. And every biofuel trade association seems to have their own statistics or data points on these benefits. I'm happy to share NBBs if you need them. Our uh, data is on both transportation fuels and heating oils, which are uh, both supported under the renewable fuel standard. And we know that environmental groups, uh, some environmental groups have been rejecting all liquid fuels and all internal combustion engines in their early statements regarding the new Green Deal, which is um, kind of an undefined proposal among new House Democrats, but um, seems to be a priority and, and will be defined over the coming months. 
So em emphasizing progress on climate and carbon reductions through the renewable fuel standard it will be effective talking points for legislators. This, there are particular benefits and, and uh, progress that has occurred at local levels and through programs like Clean Cities that are important data points for legislators. So um, happy to share data as well and, uh, and to coordinate with anyone on, on those efforts. But with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Ken. Great, thanks, Paul. I have a quick question for you, Paul. As the, as the EPA goes through the reset process, um, what opportunities will there be Can they, how can they best work with groups like NBB to participate in that process? Well, that's great. Um, the EPA will propose a rule and they will uh, publish it for, for public comment in the Federal Register. There's usually a 60-day timeline for these rules. And um, you know a web portal for submitting comments. Uh, NBB is happy to share draft comments on the rule. We will, you know, work with our member companies to develop uh, a set of comments, and, and many times our, our members will will join us in submitting similar comments or, or uh, draft comments. There's also a process for meeting with uh, the Office of Management and Budget as a stakeholder prior to the finalization of the rules. And that is a, yet another opportunity to let the administration know how these rules could impact um, stakeholders in the program. Great. Thanks, Paul, very much. Um, let's see. Next up, we're going to talk um, about uh, funding. Um, as I mentioned previously, the two main programs that um, we're focused on are uh, funding of the Department of Energy Clean Cities Program and the EPA Diesel Emission Reduction Grant. Um, whoops. Let's do let's do infrastructure first. I've got my slides out of order here. So, um, as I think people have heard, um, there's been a, a lot of discussion about infrastructure um, and. Uh, Certainly, President Trump has talked a lot about infrastructure uh, ideas, and um, uh, with the recent election, some think there may be some opportunities. So I'm going to turn it back to Allison Cunningham with NGV America, who's going to talk a little bit on um, what's going on with infrastructure legislation and where things might go um, in the next year or two. So, Allison, back to you. Thanks, Ken. Uh, as you mentioned, there is bipartisan interest in a comprehensive infrastructure package. NGV America, along with other trades like EEI, EVTA, and APGA, have been working on a series of pro-alternative fuel policies to float around for consideration. Um, I think this is something we may have discussed even bringing forward at um, next month at, at your summit. We are working on those as Democrat offices and others are seeking input on various ideas and proposals for an infrastructure package. Timing of this package remains unclear and paying for infrastructure remains a concern. Uh, as we look to discussions around a 21st century infrastructure, I think it will include a desire to ensure that we pay into the Highway Trust Fund I think that that will include discussions of miles traveled tax or increasing the gas tax or 
other mechanisms that will ensure that, that highway trust funds solvent for many years to come. I think it's also worth noting that infrastructure will likely also include items not related to transportation. So while we hear infrastructure and we are very excited about those possibilities, just bear in mind that that will also probably involve a lot of items such as kind of broadband and, and internet access across the country and in rural areas. Permitting reform is big on in the energy sphere. sphere and I know that um, lots of energy utilities and other energy infrastructure um, organizations are really concerned about permitting reform, so that will be something that's in there as well. Uh, it's also worth bearing in mind that we are anticipating a recession. You know, a lot of people are beginning to think that the economy may change a bit next year. The prognosis for infrastructure projects may improve if they are seen as job opportunities. Certainly, we have seen that in the past. We have seen funding go to new shovel-ready jobs, new infrastructure jobs, and things along those lines. So that may be something that changes that calculus about whether, you know, how we're willing to pay for a big infrastructure package, what that really looks like. I know that the administration has also made it clear that they want to have any infrastructure package not just benefit cities. They really want rural areas to benefit. Uh, we are hopeful at NGV America that with Democrats in control in the House now, there will be other efforts to ensure that there's clean air priorities there. We would love to obviously see natural gas heavy duty vehicles used wherever possible in um, some of those construction or other related projects. So some of those things is what we'll be pushing for internally and with other stakeholders as well. Great, thanks Allison. Can you, can you say a little bit more about the kinds of um, alternative fuel ideas that your um, working group has been discussing just to give people a little bit of a Flavor? Are we talking about, um, you know, uh, for example, funding of the alternative fuel corridors that um, that the Department of Transportation has been planning? Are we looking at um, other kinds of fueling infrastructure like CNG stations, propane stations, electric vehicle charging networks, um, and anything you can say about just some of the ideas that you are discussing with your uh, working group. Sure, um, and while I am not the person who's been leading the working group, we have been very involved in it, and we are looking at kind of a bunch of different opportunities, you know, to just bring attention to alternative fuels, to make sure that they are kind of a part of the conversation, to see if there are any programs that need to be modified, any kind of federal fleet requirements that we need to look at. We are not really discussing tax incentives. Um, I've been in a part of kind of a handful of other infrastructure kind of working groups as well. And it seems like a lot of folks want to let individual trades focus on their own or individual industries focus on their own tax credits or tax incentives for things like that. So I think really we're just wanting to make sure that um, programs, you know, like DERA and others really kind of work as they're intended to um, and, you know, making sure that all those things chug along and seeing if there's any change to certain programs that might ensure that more money can go to transportation as opposed to other kind of various programs. So we're still working through some of that and, and seeing where some of those ideas go. Um, we also have some kind of talks about the corridors issue. Um, Senator Carper has been working on a corridors bill for many, many months now. Um, it has a very high price tag, but we are working with them to make sure that it is fuel neutral, kind of all of the above. We think it's a, a good bill. I haven't heard what the plan is for that now, but I'm hopeful that that will be a part of a conversation moving forward, um, which will again get into kind of the funding, but it does seem that that corridors bill, which would basically fund the corridors outlaid in the FAST Act, um, would give them some funding and would be able to build out infrastructure um, in that regard and kind of encourage people to do that. So those are kind of some of the things we've been kicking around in that regard. Great, thanks. And here's another question related to, um, this is a technical question and um, it has to do with EV charging. I don't know Josh um, and infrastructure, but I'm gonna ask you this and if we don't know the answer, we'll get back to them. But the question is how important and connected is the grid management and balancing aspect of coordinating EV charging and including and including appropriate smart grid 
infrastructure funding as part of the FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's resilience proceeding. So the questions about um, the, the interplay between smart grid infrastructure and EV charging infrastructure and how that relates. This is a regulatory proceeding, which I'm not familiar with the details of. Um, I don't know if Josh or anybody else has been tracking that at all or if we should get back to people. So we have actually not been tracking that FERC proceeding, but we have been engaged in utility and PUC proceedings across the country when it comes to EV infrastructure investment. And certainly the, a lot of utilities recognize the potential benefit of EVs to help with load management. Um, and we're trying to sort of steer utilities in the right direction when uh, making investments and upgrading infrastructure and figuring out how to best tell their customers about the wonderful benefits of plugging in to fuel your vehicle. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> so with that, we're going to switch. Bring funding for the DOE Clean Cities program and the EPA Clean Diesel Grants. Um, the current fiscal year, which is fiscal year 2019, started on October 1st. And for the first time in I don't know how many years, the uh, appropriations bill that funds the Department of Energy was signed into law um, prior to the fiscal year beginning, which is unheard of in recent years. Um, and despite the efforts of uh, the administration to eliminate the Clean Cities Program through the work of uh, transportation energy partners, the Clean Cities coalitions, and our allies around the country, we were able to um, see funding for the program increase to $37.8 million. So this is a huge victory um, for 20, uh, 2019 um, and the Department of Energy is funded and open and because the funding bill was done on time um, uh, the department is able to uh, get that funding flowing and to um, uh, they're already working on competitive grants they've already provided increased funding um, to the Clean Cities Coalition. So this has been a, a, a big victory, which we're all very proud of. Um, EPA, on the other hand, was in a good place to see a good level of funding for the um, diesel emission re reduction grants. Um, the House bill included $100 million, and the Senate bill included $50 million, and the FY18 number was um, $75 million. And uh, again, the administration, I don't think they proposed elimination of the um, diesel emission reduction grants, but I think they were um, uh, proposed cutting the program to about $10 million. So again, um, we did good work with Congress to see the funding maintained. Unfortunately, um, EPA is, uh, the EPA bill was not completed on time and as a result, um, EPA is now caught in the shutdown. So it remains to be seen where um, where the, the DERA program is gonna end up in terms of funding for, uh, for the uh, uh, coming year. <clears throat> in terms of the, the, the next uh, appropriations process, the fiscal year 2020 process, um, it is supposed to get underway in early February with the, when the president proposes uh, his budget. Um, it's unclear with the shutdown whether that's going to happen on time or not, um, number one. And then number two, as I mentioned earlier, there's a big um, question about the overall uh, funding number, um, which needs to be negotiated before the appropriations bills can move forward in a serious way. But typically, um, the subcommittees would 
uh, consider their legislation uh, in April and May and sometimes into June. There would be floor action in the summer and final legislation in the fall. Um, here are the key appropriations leaders. Um, uh, they're the same leaders. The only difference is on the House side, we now have the Democrats uh, chairing the sub key subcommittees. Marcy Kaptur will chair the subcommittee um, uh, that funds Department of Energy, and Betty McCollum from Minnesota will now chair the uh, Interior Appropriations Subcommittee that funds EPA. Um, uh, we have strong uh, partners and clean cities coalitions in both of those states. And so we'll be counting on uh, Clean Fuels Ohio and the Twin Cities Coalition to continue to play leadership roles with their with their members. Um, uh, I'm not going to talk in detail about this, but we will talk about this at the summit and we will have one more webinar for people coming to the summit to get you ready. Um, uh, with final details on making sure you're prepared. Um, and that's pretty much the current situation with funding. Um, and then finally, just to touch briefly, um, many of you may know the Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Program, which is um, uh, run by the Federal Highway Administration, um, has been a major source of uh, funding of clean vehicle projects around the country. It's helped folks fund um, greener and cleaner garbage trucks, natural gas garbage trucks, uh, propane, electric and natural gas school buses, um, and many other different kinds of vehicles across the country. Um, unfortunately, <coughs> the Highway Administration is holding up funding for hundreds of uh, clean vehicle projects around the country while it looks at um, new Buy America policies. Uh, essentially, over the past several years, there's been an agreement that as long as these vehicle projects were, had final assembly in the United States, they would be considered uh, compliant with the Buy America program. Um, but the current administration is reviewing that and in the meantime has projects on hold, which is um, not a good thing. And we're working to break that log jam. We've been in discussions with the Department of Transportation, and it's very likely that we're gonna need to get Congress involved in this effort. Um, but that's another major priority for us. Um, uh, to start to wrap up, what do we need to continue to do? <coughs> continue to educate the administration. Um, you should work with your members of Congress, rally your stakeholders. <clears throat> and again, I want to encourage folks to attend the Energy Independence Summit in February. It's a great opportunity and, uh, and an, um, a, an important and valuable way <clears throat> to uh, um, work with members of Congress and to advance our efforts and advance markets for cleaner vehicles. With that, again, thanks to our sponsors. Thanks to all of our participants today. Um, I don't see any major new questions. Um, one question, I'll give this to Allison. Um, uh, which is, and and uh, Josh, both of you may take this, um, is, are there any incentives, um, I know there aren't, are, the question is about incentives for medium duty vehicles, and are there efforts to um, create incentives for medium duty vehicles? That's the question, and uh, that could be different fuels. So I don't know, Allison, if you want to take a crack at that. And then Josh, I don't know if the electric cars um, bills did anything for medium duty vehicles or if it was only for light duty. Um, so Allison, you want to go first? Sure. In the past, um, 
the electric vehicle credit that we discussed a little bit earlier had been extended to other alternative fuels such as natural gas. Uh, that went away for natural gas in, I want to believe, I want to say it was 2015, don't quote me on that, but that was because basically the two credits moved in two separate legislative packages. So one thing that we have been arguing for is a return of that credit and the eligibility of that credit for natural gas vehicles just so that we have parity and are competing on an even playing field. In terms of that, the likelihood of that happening because of the way tax extenders are and the kind of the, the nature of tax credits right now, I don't see a whole lot of likelihood that that will be enacted. Um, in terms of incentives for medium duty, there certainly are different ways to get money for vehicles. Obviously, um, the VW settlement was one of those. Um, Deer or CMAC or other where they kind of give money as incentive to purchase other vehicles. Um, other things that we are working on, it's not necessarily an incentive, but another big priority of NGV Americas is to fix the delta on the um, federal excise tax for heavy duty natural gas trucks. Those um, are, are kind of taxed a, a little unfairly just because it's taxed on the base cost of a truck and natural gas trucks are a little bit more expensive. So you would like to just kind of pay the base diesel price so the same amount that diesel trucks pay. So there are kind of a, a various different incentives federally and I know that there are a bunch of different opportunities at the state level even if they're not vehicle tax credits, but we do support that being extended back to NGVs. Great. Josh, any, uh, has there been any discussion of the, um, in the electric cars legislation? Great. So that's something that um, we might want to consider. Um, and then there was one other question, a, a semi-technical question for you, Josh, which is um, in terms of the analysis on the on the low maintenance costs um, for electric vehicles, um, did you factor in at all? Was it considered the issue of battery issue and cost of battery replacement in terms of was that included in your analysis, I think, is the question. Uh, no, it, it wasn't. Um, and that's because battery degradation is uh, forecast actually not to be that much of a concern. Um, some studies from the National Academies of Science have found that uh, after 10 years of use, an electric vehicle's battery pack should degrade around maybe 10 to 20 percent maximum. So if you have an EV that has a range of 200 miles to start with, which is really kind of like the base range for today's EVs, if you lose 10% off that range, you can still go 180 miles, which is, you know, plenty. And even if you lose 20%, going down to 160 miles of full range isn't, isn't really that big of a deal. Um, so as we see EV technology continue to improve and ranges continue to increase upwards of 250, 300 miles on a full charge, um, battery de degradation will will certainly mean less and less um, uh, as we go forward. Great. All right. With that, um, I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. Great information. I want to thank uh, all the participants out there. Thank you for participating. And uh, um, I look forward to seeing uh, hopefully all of you at the Energy Independence Summit in uh, February, uh, please uh, go to www.transportationenergypartners.org to register. Um, we will have these uh, slides and the recording of today's webinar up on the Transportation Energy Partners webinar shortly so you can get the information and have everybody's contact information. So thanks again to the panelists. Thanks again to the participants. And uh, we look forward to speaking with you again soon. Take care.